Shiratato. Good e afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council. Welcome to councillors, staff, um, the media, and the public. Uh, we'll start today, as we normally do, with an opening prayer. And uh, we have Reverend Peter Wishart from Knox Church. Well, let us pray, Eternal God. From you come wisdom and understanding. Bless and uphold those who are about to take counsel together on matters pertaining to the life of this city. Grant them strength to meet the many demands made upon them. And bless them as they face the pressure and uncertainty of the local body elections. Enable those who will be elected to discharge the duties of their office and ever promote the well-being of our city and its citizens. And may those who will not be elected rise above their disappointment and seek other ways of serving our city. God in faith, we pray to you, in your mercy, hear and answer our prayers. Amen. There are no apologies, but before I confirm the agenda, I'd like to note the passing of a long-term employee of the Neen City Council, Don Hill, who, as I understand it, was employed here for 29 years and as a transportation engineer, and I would ask that we stand for uh, a few moments' silence in memory of Don, please. Councillor, who would like to um, speak briefly uh, with regard to Don, because there'll be some here uh, who've served with him. Councillor Noon. Uh, thank you, Wish. It was rather ironic that um, we're considering a transportation strategy later on in the agenda and, uh, and receiving the news that you've just delivered with regards to Don Hill's passing. But... Um, I think Don will be remembered, remembered as, a, as a visionary uh, in terms of planning for the future roading infrastructure in the city. And I, I can recall uh, Councillors Brown, uh, Councillors Staines, um, I can't remember the others uh, who were involved in the working party for the last transportation strategy. And, and Don was, was very firm in his view in terms of the the long-term planning for uh, particular freight demands uh, from road transport through the city and um, the idea of having the link um, from Andy Bay along Strathallan Street, Port Portsmouth Drive, Thomas Burns through to Anzac Ave and, uh, and through and out to the port was a seed that was sown during that process and uh, yeah, he, he was passionate about uh, transport in every sense of the word and up until probably 12, 14 months ago he was still active uh, and involved in the road safety partners that uh, is a group that represents uh, the City Council, ORC, police, um, ACC uh, who get together um, on a fairly regular basis to discuss road safety issues and he was obviously also very active with Traffins as well um, up until relatively recently I understand so just on behalf of us all I'd just like to pass on um, our condolences to the family, Don's family and uh, we're certainly thinking of them all. Thank you. All right I'll move on now to the confirmation of the agenda. I'll move from the chair that we confirm the agenda with the exception of Items 18 and 17, I'd just like to switch the order of them because of the people who will be here uh, advising us. It just makes it more convenient for them. So with that exception, seconded Councillor Staines. Is there any discussion? Councillor Staines. 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 Councillor
Put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? <coughs> Carried. Um, item three is from <coughs> declaration of interest <coughs> note. Uh, and moving on to item four, I'll move from the chair that the public part of the minutes of the meeting of the Dunedin City Council held on the 19th of August 2013 be confirmed as a correct record. Second, Councillor Staines. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. We're on to the minutes of the committee. Number five, hearings committee, Councillor Weatherill. Thank you, sir. Uh, for bre brevity of the statement, but it's set in order paper, I'll move 5A and 5B. Taken as presented. Seconded, Councillor oh, Noon. Sorry, sir, I apologise. 5A only. Part right. 1 and uh, part 1 part 2. 5A. Seconded, Councillor Noon. Discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Uh, 5B, I think that's Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. For the same reason, um, efficiency, I'll move that uh, 5B uh, be, uh, be noted. Thank Second you. to Councillor Butcher. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 5C, I think Councillor Noon again. Uh, I'll also move uh, 5C as set out in the order paper. Second to Councillor Stevenson. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. 5D, Councillor Weatherall. Thank you, sir. I'll move that 5D is set out in the order paper be taken. Second to Councillor Vandivis. Discussion? I'll put all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. 5E, Councillor Wilson. Aye. I'll move that, uh, as per the order paper, the motion um, under 5E. Seconded. Seconded to Councillor Weatherall. Oh, apologies. I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 6, Community Development Committee, Councillor Act. Thank you, Worship. I'll move that the Part A items 1 to 5 and 7 of the minutes of the Community Development Committee meeting held on the 2nd of September 2013 be noted. Second to Councillor Hudson. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Further move, Your Worship, that. Uh, following Part B item of the minutes of the Community Development Committee held on the 2nd of September 2013 be approved, and that is item 6, Natural Burials. Second to Councillor Hudson. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And your worship, I move that the part, the part C item, item 8 of the minutes of the same meeting held on the 2nd of September 2013 be taken in the non-public part of this meeting. Second to Councillor Hudson. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Item 7, Infrastructure Services Committee, Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. I'll move Part A, items 1 to 5 <coughs> and 7 of the minutes of the Infrastructure Services Committee meeting held on the 3rd of September 2013 be noted. Councillor Vandivis. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. I'll further move to worship the part, the part B item of the minutes of the Infrastructure Services Committee meeting held on the 3rd of September 2013 be approved, being item 6, proposed waste management and minimisation amendments, following public consultation. Seconded. Councillor McTavish. I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 8, Planning and Environment Committee, Councillor Wilson. Your Worship, I'll move that the minutes of the Planning and Environment Committee meeting held on the 3rd of September 2013 be noted. Second to Councillor Stevenson. Discussion? Put all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 9, Finance Strategy and Development Committee, Councillor Brown. Your Worship, I move that part A items 1 to 5 and 7 of the minutes of the Finance and Strategy Development Committee meeting held on the 4th of September be noted. I wish to speak to item four, thank you. Uh, well, I'll just take a second to finish. A second to finish. Councillor Is it? Oh, sorry, no, I wasn't here at that meeting. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, so I wasn't it. either, sir. Councillor Hudson will second it. That's fine. Councillor Brown. <coughs> yes, I specifically want to speak to the 12 month result because it, I'm in a position that I can clearly actually talk with authority on the position. And I'm concerned that uh, the information that's been disseminated among some of the election campaigns at the moment 
and I can quite categorically talk about this because I'm not standing, but I just want to make sure that the public are aware of the true facts and, um, and they can't be um, interpreted in any other way. And the first thing that I would like to talk to is the pre-election report. Under the Local Government Act now, the Chief Executive must put out a pre-election report and they must do basically what was the State of the Nation report that the, the Government used to do and now it's the State of the City report. And in the State of the City report, the Chief Executive, without any input from councillors, actually states what the financial position of council is. And in that statement, he clearly states, quite clearly, that the forecasted debt position of the council was 227 million. The uh, debt for the stadium was 144 million, and the debt for city holdings was 249 million. Now that they are the correct and accurate figures as at the time of that report. I can now confirm that our annual report has been uh, completed and the debt position of the city is 225 million. The, cons the debt for the stadium is 145 million and the debt for um, DCHL is 253 million. And what I want to make sure that the public are aware of is that the consolidated debt position, if you add all those up, comes to um, 623 million. But of that, 253 million belongs to our companies. And that 253 million allows the companies to return to this council $15.7 million worth of dividends after servicing that debt. So it is a debt that has against it a whole lot of assets. And if they realised all those assets, we would have uh, a considerable amount over to reduce the core council debt. But we would also lose that dividend stream, which is so important to the rate power in off offsetting their rates. So I want to make sure that the general public are aware of that situation, that that's the true position of council. There's also been comments made that we don't understand our finances and our debts. Well, our accounts are public accounts and they're audited by Audit New Zealand. They go down to every minutiae and they actually look at all the councillors' uh, involvement in any uh, transactions with council as well. So they're an audited position. So there's no hidden factors whatsoever. Everything is available. Everything is audited. I then come on to capital expenditure. And I will ask Carolyn to hand round um, a paper that I've asked her to prepare so that uh, everyone is aware and it will go on the website as well that on our capital expenditure program we have in our long term financial plan our 10 year uh, plan we have the planned capital expenditure in the 11, 12, 12, 13 and 13, 14 year the capital expenditure that this council entered into other than that that was previously committed, was 21.2 million. Of that 21.2 million, 6.8 million is made up of earthquake strengthening and eco housing. And that is where we have raised loans for the community on the basis that they repay those loans and they service those loans. So in the essence, this council has approved over the three years 14.4 million of capital expenditure projects. On the other side of the ledger, we have reduced capital expenditure that was planned in our plan by 39 million. So I just want to make, these are accurate figures that I am not here electioneering. I'm actually making sure that the public of Dunedin has the true and accurate position to assess the performance of the previous councils over the last two terms. Okay. I'm going to put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Councillor Brown. I to move that the following Part B item on the Minutes of Finance and Strategy Development Committee meeting held on the 4th of September be approved. Welcome to Harvesting Revenue.
Sorry. Is there a, sec is there a seconder? Yeah, but I'll come to you. Is there a seconder for that? Councillor Hudson. Councillor Weatherall. Yes, sir. I would like to ask your indulgence to recommit uh, the resolutions subject to that item 6, with particular reference to item 2. Uh, I do, do apologise at the meeting, but I wasn't available. I'd like to background it briefly prior, sir, and ask the Council to reconsider uh, the further information that is, is available, wasn't available, but I wasn't able to deliver on that particular day. Do you, do you, I'm happy if you, do you, are you moving? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously comfortable. This is where I need your guidance. Resolutions 1, and one, and 3 and further are all fine. It's the resolution 2 that I'd like recommitted the opportunity to speak to, sir. Well, I'm happy to take a motion, if that's the best way. Yeah, well, I think I'm just trying to simplify it, sir. Um, there was five resolutions, four are fine, one I'd just like the opportunity to seek my colleagues further endorsement of or consideration of. Right, then what's your, what's your essentially, you're moving an amendment, I think. Yes, yes sir, in, in item two, where, where the resolution is that uh, funds be committed to the main street uh, beautification, beaut beaut where the vote was lost. Um, I'd like Council to reconsider that vote, sir, that's all. Right, so you... With some further information. Effectively moving an amendment, is there a second? Councillor Noon. Uh, do you wish to speak to this now, Councillor Witherall? Yes, sir, thank you. Folks, the, the context of the whole article is fine. The report that came from Parks and Reserves was accepted by the Community Board. The recommendation by our Executive Management team uh, had made one minor change, sir. The surplus has come from a community funded project. Let's be very clear. This project started 35, 40, nearly 40 years ago in the small community of Fairfield, where the community formed a liaison relationship and partnership with the county of the day, which was Torrey, then moved through to Silver Peaks, and I accept amalgamation in 89 and long time gone. But the project was always identified for, funded by the self rating community of Fairfield for the benefit of the Fairfield community. Now that's the ground rules that were set of the day. I accept there was a very strong argument about amalgamation of one better city and whatever, but what I say, sir, is out of this project now where there is a surplus of 127,000 that has the majority opportunity to be supportive of the Dunedin City Council to retire some debt in line with the strategy, there are two components. The one, the first one, I was pleased to see that the committee supported a small improvement within the Walton Park Reserve. The second one, sir, is clearly what the project started for. It was started to raise funds for when the motorway was taken out of the centre of that community and re-established adjacent to Fairfield, that in conjunction with the authority of the day, and that happened to be the DCC now, and Land Transport New Zealand, that some return from a straight through high speed motorway to that community would be done by some beautification. Well, well done, sir. The city's done, done a piece of it, and so is the community board, and so is the community to some degree. Land Transport put a bloody new piece of seal through and called it quits. Walked away from any responsibility to revert that community from a State Highway 1 to a community road, which it is now. All we're asking for is after many years of sharing the resource the community board has and some local folk, is to finish that beautification of the road reserve. There is a small section in the centre of Fairfield which would benefit by having a small share of the profits gained in this project for the benefit of that community. Currently that amount is set, sir, at $10,000. It is likely to be much less, administered by, as the project has been to the seven plates completion stage by PAR, I think it's PARS, we now call it, more parks and reserves, and that would allow that small acknowledgement to be finished. What I'm asking for, sir, is for this council to acknowledge in a small way the completion of that, the, the ability to complete that project under council's control, currently in the community board plan, currently not funded, but the community board will battle for another year or two to try and get there. But this is one opportunity to say of the surplus that's been gained after meeting our statutory obligations to meet the carbon tax, to relay that wilderness that was a a wild, um, wild reserve into a community asset, acknowledging that the contribution has been identified and hopefully continue to be supported to support the school in their project. 
a small amount, sir, to complete that project and in the life of the current community. Not ask you for it all. I think I could, I could have a great argument about getting 127,000 spent back in that community. Not at all. 107,000 and a little bit should go to retirement of debt and the principle of what council's doing. But a small amount to complete a project that that community has been deserted by. A national authority. All they did was sell over the bloody potholes, put a few white lines in and said that's your lot. That is an important community and a growth community to the city and I think it's a small piece that this city could acknowledge and complete the project on the way through and still bank and retire our chief executive, sorry, retire some funds for our chief executive for $109,000 plus to complete that. Thank you, sir. Just bear with me while I take yep. some advice. Just, just to be utilised. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, 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 So I have to put these separately again. I've just taken some advice as to process and apparently um, we cannot have an amendment that's in direct contradiction of the motion. So, however, pedantic as it is, we have another process to get the same outcome. So let's try that one. What we will do, I will do, is I put all of the recommendations in. There's a, there's a the motion. Um, seeks approval of the full um, set of five recommendations from the Finance Strategy and Development. Um, I am going to put each of those recommendations separately and we can vote them. And the one you're concerned with, Councillor Weatherall, is number two. Thank you, sir. We'll put them all separately. If number two is lost, then I uh, will ask you to... Um, we'll, put, we'll put the contrary. Thank you, sir. Okay? So, it, in the meantime, uh, uh, there's other speakers who wish to speak to this, so Councillor Wilson. It's just for clarification, um, because I thought there was going to be an amendment, I was just wanting to know what the amendment actually was, because it wasn't clear to my mind how much was being sought, and I think that may help in the debate if we're sheer clear, because I'm not sure if it's 10,000 or something less, having heard Councillor Weatherall speak, um, and it may give us some clarity as to our vote going forward. Well, um, you might want to clarify yes, for the sake um, of to, to ease it and make it simple to understand, up to ten thousand dollars. <laughs> well, sir, sir, simpler, but it's not clear necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> the I've got, sir, I, I, I would be relaxed to move five thousand. There's no issue. But well, we actually don't have. We don't know yet. Quite up to ten thousand. Up to. I'm happy with that. So that's for the understanding of the of the councillors. Councillor Thompson, did you wish to speak? Um, I'm just. Sorry, I don't wish to complicate things, in which case I wouldn't stand up, so I do wish to complicate things. <laughs> um, I'm just not quite sure if, um, if, if we vote down, as you suggest, and then were we then to vote down uh, Councillor Weatherall's uh, motion, where does that leave us? Um, no, but where does that leave us then in terms of the original recommendation? Um, well, I, I've unlikely, given, if, if everyone understands what it is that we see that Councillor Weatherall is seeking to do, it's unlikely that we would vote down both because they are in direct contrast to each other. Councillor Brown. <coughs> Can I just seek some clarification, especially from Councillor Weatherall? If we go back to the FS and D papers, it quite clearly states here, and, and this is what was a, uh, a point for me, that records indicate that the planting was carried out as a community initiative under the Silver Peaks County Council with the revenue from harvesting to be used for the benefit of this reserve, or reserves in Fairfield. Right? So the request from the Fairfield School 
Is that to beautify a reserve? Yes, sir, it's absolutely important part. Part of the Wooden Park project. Thank you. And the main road? Main road to reserve? Yes, it's the third bill. It's the road reserve, and I ask for council. I know. Beauty reserve. It's really long time. I don't understand. Senator. I'm going to put, there were five recommendations, I'm going to put them one after the other, and just to clarify everyone's understanding, the second one needs, will be the same recommendations that went to finance strategy and development. So they need to be, if, if Councillor Weatherall's intention is to be carried through, the second one needs to be won, not lost. In other words, we're putting the same recommendations as went to finance strategy and development, and Councillor Weatherall is seeking council support for a different result for number two than was achieved at the finance strategy and development meeting, and that I think addresses Councillor Thompson's problem too. Because we only wrote once. So can I just ask for some clarification? So number two, is it for 10,000 to be utilised for the completion of the main road project, or five? Up to ten. Up to ten. Yeah, so that. All right, is there, are there any for the St Councillor Noon? I, I support this uh, request from the uh, from Councillor Weatherall on behalf of his community. I think that... Uh, looking back in time and uh, prior to 1989, uh, prior to amalgamation, there were various parts of the city that had um, had assets, various parts of the city had liabilities, it's probably fair to say all, all parts of the city had both, but at the end of the day, in this particular situation, there was an intent to uh, ensure that that income generated from those trees were, well the income was, was um, invested back into the community in some shape or form. So I think there was an intent there, and I believe that we, as the um, the offspring of amalgamation, have some obligation to ensure that we carry out that, that original intent. And I think the other point I want to make is that uh, with the carbon credits that the city's been able to uh, reap the, uh, the revenue from the carbon credits, and I accept that they need to replant this area in natives, which is a significant cost, but I think it would be fair to say, by receiving that revenue, um, that was a bonus because the reality would be if that uh, carbon credit didn't exist, we would still be replanting the area in natives. So I think that is a, a substantial benefit to the city. Further speakers? Councillor Stevens. Yeah, I'm supportive. I was a little bit concerned that we weren't being even handed between areas with community boards in urban areas, because there's also been Alice Park in Kaikoura Valley, um, Bethune's Gully, and Ross Creek, which have also had trees milled and are all in urban areas. However, in those cases, a lot of the cost had to go back into the re-establishment of the area back into natives. So um, I just think that we need to always be even-handed so that the, the urban areas also have a go at having some return going back to the community and we don't just focus on the community boards, but given that, I'm still very supportive of this particular project. Further speakers? Councillor Brown. Yes, sir. <laughs> My position has changed on this. Uh, originally, I took a firm position on process, but it's now been clarified for me that this is a reserve, and so therefore, in my mind, it meets the, um, the promise that the community made at the time to the local community, and I fully support it. Council comments. I just very briefly mention I, I supported it originally, will certainly support it here again today, and and I don't think councils need to be reminded that it's not new money we're seeking here. It's money that the uh, community uh, got from the trees that were planted 40 years ago before even amalgamation. So they deserve that cash to be 
taken from the fund and used in the way that it was requested. Councillor Vance. The staff report and the intent of this new money, whether it's new or old, was that it go back to pay off debt. I'm concerned that we have a situation where it's just all too easy to find yet another opportunity to spend money we don't have and not pay off debt as per the staff recommendation and as per the requirement for what happened to this money. I don't believe that there is any uh, moral um, uh, obligation to uh, throw another $10,000 at, at the completion of a Fairfield beautification project. We haven't seen what this $10,000 is going to be spent on. We haven't seen any details of what sort of value we might be getting for it. We have a clear direction from staff that this money is supposed to go back into paying off debt. Uh, we have had lots of talk about paying off debt. And if you look at what has happened, that debt keeps growing at a completely unsustainable rate. I'll be voting against uh, taking this money out of paying off debt, as I have consistently. And I believe that unless we get some firm <coughs> idea of what value we might be getting for this $10,000, that we should all be making sure that we aren't just spending more money on the eve of an election. <coughs> just before I come back to you, Councillor Witherall, I'll um, address this myself. Um, I supported this uh, allocation back to the community at the Finance Strategy and Development meeting because I made a distinction between the assets that the boroughs had when amalgamation occurred and assets that were actually put in place and owned by the community and there's a difference and this is actually quite rare that the community actually had some asset uh, and that is uh, a part of that is what is being asked for um, to go back to the community so I, in answer to Councillor Vanderbilt's point what value do we get it's not the council who's looking for the value it is the community because it's their, uh, it's their asset so I support this as well. Councillor Weatherill, would you like to write a report? Oh, Councillor Zed. I just want to make one um, <coughs> comment with regards to uh, what Councillor Vanderbilt said. And I just remind him it is up to $10,000. It is not $10,000 that we're going to give to the community. Councillor. Can I just ask? Um, <laughs> I, I'm considering uh, changing my view on this, but partly because I think taking lead from you, Mayor, about um, this being a community asset, it's also about how the community look after a, a long-term asset and grow it. And if we want to have a community looking after it in good husbandry, it's really important that occasionally we reward them as well. And for that reason, I'm prepared to consider a change. But I'm just wondering, because of the vagaries, and I do appreciate what Councillor Vandervis says in his um, summing up, whether there needs to be... Um, well, it's right of reply, should I say, whether the, 10, 000, the process is what the process will be or whether it requires a tighter resolution as to how the 10,000 is, um, and who it goes to and how, how that planning for the planting is dealt with because I think that's an area of vagary that I think needs to be tightened up. Councillor Wedderall, you're right. Thank, thank you, sir. Can I just answer the last question first? Certainly all community board has a plan like all community boards and a segment within that plan includes beautification and completion of the project at Fairfield. Supplementary to that is the landscape architect's plan of, of, of the area. Uh, Barry Knox is well recognised in the city. There is a plan that's been followed and all that sits nice tidily wrapped up within the Parks Department or PARS Department of Council. So there is a plan. It's already been drawn, it's concepted and it's been agreed in principle with the community and step by step the community board have been working towards to achieving it. So there is a plan. And I'm more than happy to provide to any of my colleagues and Council Vanderbilt for short, and I respect that, a copy of the Community Board Plan highlighting the segment and the plan that is there. It is not a pipe in the sky. It is a plan that's been worked on for a number of years. So the project is alive, living, needing some support. Can I just comment, sir, to Council Vanderbilt? I understand the debt. 
heard the explanation from my colleague Councillor Brown today about the city debt. That this never was a debt. It never was a debt. It has had a zero percent of gain from one, when the first trees were put in the ground planted by the community, to the harvesting of the trees, and we've seen the report and the significant income and the very good contract that the department achieved by achieving bonus money. They did superbly well. They took a risk into, an, into one or two options. And they took the right risk and it recorded us with a payment of a carbon credit and a replanting program and a surplus of 127000 Perhaps one or two other departments might achieve the same goals and we wouldn't have so much debt. So this has never been a debt. So it is not retiring a debt that was ever incurred by this community. The community paid for and funded the project. So sir, on that basis, I'm happy to leave it, but I will provide that information and support of my colleagues. It's just going to be a couple of days to circulate it, please. Thank you. Now, I have been reminded that I have heard in process, and indeed the motion uh, was moved by Councillor Brown. So um, we will uh, I'll offer Councillor Brown now his right of reply. <laughs> But from my point of view, I think it's a, a very clear situation now where there's a surplus of 127,000, the community are asking for 20,000 of that, so there's 107,000 from the Fairfield community being given to the Lead City Council to reduce our debt. And I think that's a great uh, gesture from the community and I think we should all support this motion. Thank you. Now, I, as I said, I'm going to take the recommendations, um, or the motions one by one of the, f there are five of them. So if you want the actual wording, you need to go to item nine, the minutes of the finance strategy and development meeting. Uh, and the first one is that, the first one that I'll put is that an estimated 127,670 of surplus revenue would be achieved from the Walton Park Harvesting Aftersite Rehabilitation Track Development and Planning occurs be noted. I'm going to put that. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. The second one is the uh, one in question that Councillor Weatherall wants a different result from, that up to $10,000 be utilised for the completion of the Main Road Fairfield Beautification Project. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? No. Recorded, please. Can record Councillor Van der vote. And the third, by the, with the leave of the, the meeting, I'll just put third, three, four, and five together because they were fast. Um, so three, four, and five, I'll move. Uh, I'll put all those in favour. Please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Minutes of the community boards. Wagawadi Coast, Councillor Noon. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll move that the minutes of the meeting of the Waikawati Coast Community Board held on the 14th of August 2013 be noted. Second to Councillor Hudson. Discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Target mention. Uh, Councillor McTash. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll move that the minutes of the meeting of the Otago Peninsula Community Board, Community Board held on the 15th of August 2013 be noted. Second to Councillor Wilson. Discussion? Put all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 12, Strathtyre, Councillor Wilson. I'll move that the minutes of the meeting of the Strathtyre Community Board held on the 15th of August 2013 be noted. Second to Councillor Noon. Discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 13, Mosgill Tyre, Councillor Brown. Worship, I move the minutes of the meeting of the Mosgood Tory Community Board held on the 20th of August be noted. Second, Councillor Wilson. Discussion, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 14, Chalmers Community Board, Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. I move the minutes of the meeting of the Chalmers Community Board held on the 21st of August 2013 be noted. Second, Councillor McTavish. Discussion, just a brief comment. I'm sure. Your Worship, I, Worship, item. 14. Acknowledgement of retiring member. I'd just like to say on behalf of the council uh, really just to acknowledge Jan Tucker's contribution to uh, the Chalmers community or the um, West Harbour uh, Chalmers community. Uh, Jan obviously was heavy in, heavily involved in uh, numerous <coughs> community activities and I can think of the uh, 
the Port Chalmers District Lions Club. Uh, she was involved with the the group that welcomed local group that welcomes uh, cruise ship visitors uh, to port. Um, she's been involved in activities in uh, in uh, Purukanui as well. Lived there for quite some time. Um, a regular walker of her dog around Back Beach, and uh, she often would report at community boards about different issues that had been raised by con constituents when she was doing that circuit with her dog. Um, being an ex-school teacher, she uh, ran the meetings in a school teacher fashion, and that's not being disrespectful, but she was firm but fair, and um, she gained respect of uh, all around the table. And uh, I suppose finally, I'd just like to say she's a devil for punishment. She's got her hat in the ring for the Wahimo Community Board, so uh, good luck to her. Councillor Noon, given that you've spoken to that, would you like uh, an, uh, uh, the acknowledgement of Jan Tucker's contribution to be appended to the motion? It would be fantastic. And Thank you. The seconder is happy with that? Mm -hmm. Right. Further discussion? I'll put all those in favour. Please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Um, Saddle Hill Community Board, Councillor Wetherill. Thank you, sir. I'll move that part A is set out in the water paddle. Second to Councillor Noon. Discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you, sir. Part B, uh, can I just acknowledge my colleagues in the last few minutes for your support? That brings a close to that board's business, as far as I'm concerned. My guess will be somewhere around 200 plus community board meetings and former authority meetings. Can I just acknowledge and appreciate the support for this council and former authorities are going to that board? Thank you, sir. Second. No, the second, second to Councillor Wilson. Discussion? Put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Right, we move on to the reports. Uh, Tourism Dunedin annual report. Welcome, Hamish. Welcome, Sophie. our chair who is unfortunately ill and would dearly have liked to be here for a first annual report presentation but unfortunately can't. But I do take pleasure in presenting the annual report of Tourism Dunedin to Council on behalf of the Trustees. Um, before I start on the report itself, can I acknowledge the contribution that our previous chair Barry Timmins made to Tourism in Dunedin over the past several years prior to his resignation. In presenting the annual report, I'd like to say that with any report, results, uh, any results, context is important. Our results are operating against the global financial crisis and the ongoing dynamics of financial markets and the Canterbury earthquake, which really placed a significant halt on tourism into the South Island. It created a perfect storm. The, those events impacted on who travelled um, and while the uh, flow of travellers to the South Island is still happening, a lot of what is happening is new markets, Chinese in particular and other Asian markets which are growing while the traditional markets on which we rely have tended to decrease. Those events impact on where people are travelling to. Since 2009, <coughs> arrivals into Christchurch Airport in Australia have decreased by 82,000 people, or 28%. Arrivals into Queenstown East Australia have increased by 63,000 people, or 210%. 
But the nature of those travellers has changed. There's a dreadful tourism term called fly and flop. Uh, and that is what the people now coming into Queenstown are doing, where previously people who came into Christchurch would spend their time doing fairly extensive travels around the South Island, two or three weeks, and we would gain the benefit. There are two things I'd like to draw your attention to in our annual report before I hand over to Hamish. One is website visitation. It's a 21% increase, and if you compare it to the 12-13 year with the 2009-10 year, you'll see an almost 275% increase in visitation to our website. Three to four years ago, we, as a board, we took a strategic view on the dream plan book share cycle that people go through in planning holidays and developed our web presence around that model. We also integrated social media platforms into the delivery of content. And with currently over 35,000 likes, our reach into social media is significant. And this is the new reach into the modern world traveler. Another highlight, and one that I as an operator consider is really significant, is the high-end, high-quality, and extensive media coverage we're achieving. And this year there's over 600,000 in equivalent advertising value. Now this is a very strong performance and I think a success story for Dunedin. And it ensures that our story, the Dunedin story, and our image, the Dunedin image, is out there in the marketplace and portrayed effectively. While that doesn't give immediate results as part of creating a proper foundation, as with our website, and while we can suffer from the short-term effects of the changes in the financial world's financial situation and the changes in market strategy by tourism. New Zealand to concentrate on Asian markets. Uh, having that proper base and putting our attention where it should be placed on those key elements means that we're providing security for the future and that is part of our role as a tourism organisation. So what I'd like to do now is um, hand over to Hamish to talk a bit on cruise and on conference and the travel trade and then we can entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, tourism expenditure is now valued at $420 million to Dunedin. Uh, $120 million of tourism expenditure from the international markets. $300 million from the domestic. The Australian visitors to New Zealand, whilst increasing over time, in the last four years has actually been a decrease in Australian residents coming to New Zealand for the purpose of a holiday. So there's been a 5% reduction in holiday makers to New Zealand, as well as the obvious changes to the airports they're flying into, the 83,000 passengers less into Auckland, 63,000 passengers more into Queenstown. The other challenges have been from our traditional international markets. The UK market is down 27% to New Zealand. Over four years, that's the equivalent of 70,000 passengers. Um, there's a high, high likelihood that those UK visitors would have included Dunedin in their holidays. American visitors to New Zealand are down, over that four year period again, down 3%. And the, the striking effect is also the increase in Chinese visitors to New Zealand, um, the majority of whom um, are staying only a short time in the country, with the average length of stay being only over the, the four day mark. So obviously Dunedin's not yet getting enough out of this market, and nor is the South Island. So as we covered off in some of our report, the importance of working with other regions and working with Christchurch International Airport um, really is uh, much more important for, for Dunedin to be taking on these partnerships. During that period as well, we have seen a decline in coach touring, but we've also seen a significant increase in cruise ship visits to Dunedin. 
And compared to other regional tourism organisations and destinations, I think that we can be quite... Um, <coughs> I think we're quite lucky that we're a coastal destination when we take that into consideration. So we've been looking at what we have been able to do and where we've been able to make a difference. Tourism and visitation is a long game um, and since 2000 Dunedin has had an increase of 20%. Um, the cruise has obviously increased over the past 10 years from 43 passengers to um, over 216,000 people coming into the city. We've seen a change in how people are using coach tours and we've seen um, a reduction also in backpacker tours um, to this part of the world. In the last year, Tourism Dunedin has visited 70 travel companies um, personally on sales initiatives. We've now got a Facebook reach of over 7.8 million people. We've got Facebook subscribers of 35,000 people. We've met with 841 international travel trade and um, at uh, delegates and agents at trade events. We've hosted 93 media and trade reps in Dunedin and that, that PR and media uh, exposure um, has really come through in our annual report. We've circulated 144,000 newsletters, we've profiled 52 restaurants, um, we've achieved a significant amount of media coverage. I think the other thing that we must note as well is that uh, we do believe that the results of 2011 and the Rugby World Cup and that additional game that we got in Dunedin as well did mask the effects of the Christchurch earthquake which are ongoing. The closure of the Dunedin Town Hall and Dunedin Centre for Refurbishment also saw a significant reduction in the conference and convention delegates we were seeing and since its opening uh, at the end of April and this year uh, we've seen a great interest in business events to Dunedin. We have been promoting Dunedin as uh, the South Island's premier business events destination on the basis that it will take some time before Christchurch has uh, appropriate facilities developed and they've got their eyes on 2017 for that and we're aware also of the potential development in Queenstown. So we have a short window within, within which we should see an increase in business event, events to the city. Happy to take some questions. I'll throw it over to questions, councillors. Councillor Bazzi. <coughs> uh, Hamish, um, given that uh, you made the comment about the, um, the Chinese uh, market and the short, relatively short stay of time of four days, and looking at the percentage of Chinese that have come into New Zealand this year, which is quite significant, um, what is uh, Tourism Dunedin doing to, to, to try to attract that market? Certainly. Thank you. Um, we have been into the market uh, this year, this is the, the third year that we've been into the market uh, along with Tourism New Zealand um, and uh, training travel companies and travel agencies. The, the other significant aspect is working with Christchurch International Airport and other regional tourism organisations in the South Island uh, and collectively we have employed a South Island sales representative based in Shanghai. Um, the aim of this is to create and strengthen the business case for direct flights to the South Island. On that basis, Dunedin would benefit from um, the increasing numbers of uh, Chinese visitors coming not only to New Zealand, but we are beginning to see a shift to independent travel. So um, slowly but surely, the uh, Chinese visitors to New Zealand are beginning to travel more independently and stay a little bit longer. Councillor McTavish. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the question that I have <clears throat> is in relation to 16.5, where it states that um, in relation to the events um, uh, that we, we, we're hosting here and the hotel occupancy being amongst the highest in the country, is, that, um, is it the case that relative to other places we have um, fewer hotels, or is it the case that um, people who come to these events are more likely to stay in hotels than they are other accommodation? Both, I think both answers are correct. Um, the accommodation monitor that gives us our statistics is a very imperfect instrument. It records commercial accommodation hotels and most motels, it's voluntary, and it doesn't record a lot of the accommodation that we provide, such as you know, bed and breakfast and so on, or for people who don't fill out the form. 
Uh, and a lot of our visitors are traditional source countries who are less likely to stay in commercial hotels. So it's a bit misleading. Having said that, consistently we're getting the yield from visitors that we want. The visit tourism is all about money. You're getting a return on the investment you make. And with the fourth highest occupancy in the country, even on that imperfect measure, we're still getting a good return on the investment we make into the commercial accommodation sector. My second question, Your Worship, is just um, pertaining to <clears throat> um, the social media presence. And I think I know the answer to this already, but is there any way of um, telling um, how effective that social media presence is and the, those um, increasing number of followers that you have, how that translates into outcomes for tourism in Dunedin? Thank you. The, uh, the question of measuring conversion from um, statuses such uh, a, a difficult one so that is why we um, simply concentrate on on the reach the the time that's talked about um, Dunedin the, the potential bookings that come from our um, specific uh, marketing activities some of which we are able to 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 measure so for example where we uh, have a um, uh, where we conducted the fashion uh, one last year um, we did that in conjunction with the hotel so we we're able to actually track track those bookings and get an idea of how that how well that goes. But there's also um, the, the the pay per click or the click through rates that we're able to measure which uh, um, demonstrate obvious interest and, and potential um, potential uh, interest in travel. Councillor Vanders. On page 16.66 we're talking about KPIs. I'm looking at number seven. I have emailed staff about it in the weekend. Um, I'm still not clear. Uh, in the note three at the bottom of that page, it says that um, more than half a million dollars, over six hundred thousand dollars of it, is what's called equivalent advertising value. Is equivalent advertising value the same thing as joint venture? No. In, in fact, it's not. What we're talking about here is the advertising value we accrue from the media coverage that's obtained. Uh, from visiting journalists. And the reason why we have a figure for equivalent advertising value is because, I'll put this very bluntly in tourism terms, we pay these people. When you have a journalist come to Dunedin to write, to give coverage, we provide them with uh, free accommodation and services, and in return they produce the article. Now, from years of running my own business where we had a lot of journalists come through and we also paid for our own advertising, the media coverage that we got, the column inches that we got coverage and we're getting for Dunedin is, has a very real advertising dollar value. Uh, Tourism New Zealand, uh, when they arrange for journalists to come to an area will provide you with clippings afterwards and they will put at the bottom of that their rating of the amount of advertising column inches value that is accrued to you from that journalist's visit. So we're talking here about making an investment in people, we make an investment in the journalists and when we make an investment we expect to get a return on that investment and the equivalent advertising value counts of advice is the <coughs> measure that is applied to determine what worth we have gained by a direct, effectively monetary contribution to those people. <coughs> Thank you for that. You've confirmed that equivalent advertising value is not the same thing as a joint venture. Under the terms of your statement of intent, seven, industry support. Industry support includes both joint venture partner, 500k, and in kind 100k funding. What we have here in this report then, instead of a, a joint venture 500k, we have 600k of supposedly very real advertising value. How can you claim a result is met when the $500,000 of joint venture that's uh, indicated as necessary in your statement of intent is not here? Um, 
So the way I read it is that the joint venture funding that we negotiated with the council, um, that the target of 12th, um, the, the target was $100,000 and we achieved $134,000 in um, joint venture funding. Um, in addition to that, in-kind contribution was a separate amount. Um, the in-kind contribution has uh, uh, in the past also included the equivalent advertising value from an auditing perspective. Um, it's been requested that the equivalent advertising value now be separated out um, so that we can demonstrate what is described as the, the value of uh, in-kind uh, from our operators of uh, motel rooms, attractions and activities and in addition to that the equivalent advertising value. Um, this past year we have in fact increased uh, the equivalent advertising value um, through the employment of a dedicated um, PR and comms person. But you haven't answered the question and the question is, and I'll state it again, in the statement of intent for a KPI to be reached we have a joint venture requirement of $500,000. And what seems to have been substituted here is equivalent advertising value. Do we have $500,000 of joint venture or, or don't we? <coughs> and if we don't, how can you claim that it's been met on the bottom line? I'm, I'm sorry this has taken a while, but I, 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 I did email in the weekend hoping to get these answers. I mean, if something's happened and the statement of intent is no longer appropriate, well, that's fine, but then you can't go ahead and claim that it's been met, can you? No, well, the target intended was 600k of industry financial support, um, and the figures that we achieved at this point are 134 from JVs, Joint Ventures, um, see, target. Hamish, do you have any other comment? I don't. I, don't, I think this is a uh, misrepresent what we're aiming at. Yeah, I think I think it does. I think we'd have to get back to the councillor on that because um, I uh, I vaguely remember um, an exchange of emails um, and discussion regarding uh, our belief that we'd be unable to reach any cash by a joint venture because of the ways, um, because of the joint ventures that we are undertaking and investing in, um, and that we would be getting far more um, return on investment from uh, in-kind investment and also equivalent advertising value um, as a result of a, a largely uh, cash-strapped sector. So on that basis, would you be no, happy? No, I think your question's been answered, Councillor Vandivis. Um, I have another question. On that basis, would you be happy for us to put a question mark beside the Met in the meantime before we sign this off? No, that's been answered. Yeah. It's just been answered. Councillor Bazir. Well, sorry, I did have another question. I think it's for uh, Mr Grubb. Ray, um, with your, given that um, you really have no control over the number of tourists that come into the country and there has been a decrease in what you call our clients, so to speak. Um, is there a way, or can you think of some more meaningful way of analysing the KPIs with regards to the, uh, the decrease you've had this year of nearly 10% um, as opposed to a, a 0.5 increase which was your KPI? Is something that's more meaningful? Because, I mean, this happens quite often and um, it's really uh, difficult to measure uh, or get some meaningful measurement of how you actually operated because um, you could have been very successful in getting to the minus nine but we don't we can't measure that and uh, I just looked at the, if you've given some thought to getting some more meaningful assessment of, a, of the KBI. Thank you Councillor Bazette. Uh, the distortion in our figures is partly as a result of the Rugby World Cup because we had an extremely successful period during the Rugby World Cup and then the hangover the next year is we haven't achieved the same results. It, what it does do is that demonstrates very clearly to us the importance of events to a city and one of the things the city has done well is created the opportunity for events to take place. 
uh, with its long-term investment in facilities. I've had a long time on several uh, RTOs and when you graph your results you'll see that the RTOs that get the base right and do the job properly from the start graph consistently better results over time. We've talked about a 20% increase since year 2000 and that's a consistent graph figure. I don't think there is a way of finding a better measure of statistics than we have at the moment. What you have to do is take your averages and understand that if you have a professionally well-run organisation that gets the basis right, that's the long-term investment in websites and social media, in media itself, in marketing to agents, in creating conference and event opportunities, then you will consistently achieve a level of results with the best of the others in the country. Any other comments, Hamish, on that? I think I'll try to add to that. I, I think that um, relying on a measurement that is simply the number of, um, of rooms sold by a hotel or a motel, uh, it, it fails to, particularly in a place like Dunedin, acknowledge the numbers of visitors that we all have that stay in our spare rooms or stay in our homes or, or kip, on, kip on the floor um, for certain events. Um, a, a new measurement has come through which is called the Regional Tourism Estimates and that uh, manages to measure the investment or the purchases that are made by electronic car transactions. Um, and that's why I was able to use that figure earlier on of $420 million investment into the city over the year. That was for the year ending March 12. So the, the places where Dunedin is punching above its weight from the markets include Australia, the US, the UK and Germany, all the traditional markets for, for the region. And from a domestic market, when we compare ourselves to other regional tourism organisations, the places where we uh, again do better from are Otago, Canterbury, Southland, places within a, a four to five hour drive. Um, and we're doing uh, just under the benchmark out of Auckland. Uh, the rest of the country we, we don't do particularly well on. Um, so that's, that's a reasonable measurement. But I think that uh, where we need to get to is um, the outcome of the activities that we do, and, and that is measurable. Um, the number of uh, travel companies we talk to, the number of media that we host, those are, those are very, very real time-consuming activities um, that we hope will end up in visitation to the city. Councillor Butcher. Um, thanks, guys. Um, so, Hamish, Going back to the increase in the Chinese market, which I think is really good, and I'm just pleased to see it happening here, is there any way that you can maybe leverage more with some of the local um, education providers, with maybe some word of mouth with family members to get them here to stay longer? C certainly. Um, I think that uh, it's very helpful to have, uh, for us, the, the Shanghai uh, sister city relationship and earlier in the year we travelled with the Chamber of Commerce uh, and with the Mayor on the delegation um, which included a number of education facilities so um, we're very much part of that. I, I think that um, in addition to that our early investment in the creation of itineraries specifically for uh, the Chinese market and translated uh, by local students has been a, a great thing as well as a, a dedicated um, URL and website for um, for China. So uh, I think that uh, when we compare ourselves against other regions, uh, again, we're ahead of the eight ball in terms of the activity that we've done specific to the market. We're just yet to see the results from that. You think about it? Mm. I think the Shanghai relationship is absolutely the key. Uh, it's a long term investment by the city, uh, and Hamish and our staff are working very closely with the education people to try and realise that investment. Oh, Councillor Brown. We should want to be moved that the report be noted. Um, yes, I think just received. Is the recommendation, or do you want to change that? The recommendation says so be noted. I'm, I'm happy to receive. Yeah. Mine says received, but got noted. Just 
two different recommendations. Oh, we'll leave it. Leave it all. And, and just in speaking to the motion, um, I think we have a wonderful opportunity, as Hamas has uh, articulated, that we have a window now whereby Dunedin has all these uh, great amenities. And as a city, I think we've got to stop whinging and moaning about the cost of these amenities and actually promote them to the wider communities so that they can come and enjoy our investment and let them see what a wonderful city we have. And we now have a window with Christchurch quite a few years away and Queenstown still squabbling over where it may be. So we've got to now take that opportunity and work and capitalise on the investment and the great amenities that we have in our city. And I'm quite sure that we're going to get repeat business from those people that come back and enjoy this experience. Councillor Bazette, did I understand you correctly that you seconded that? Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Stevens. Um, I wanted to ask a question before, but I'll just speak to the motion instead. Um, I'm very supportive, and um, I suppose to Hamish and our Chief Executive, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to say that we've had meetings about um, the economic development strategy and this beautiful opportunity to market different aspects of the city and try and leverage more of our students and their parents and their family that also come and visit our city. And so though the report appears to be very China focused, our students come from all sorts of backgrounds. And if there's anything that you guys can do to work with the economic development strategy team, which I think is Mike Wendell from Polytech, to try and leverage off those students and get their family, extended family to visit us and maybe even think of investing in our city. That would be just so crash hot. So thank you. I have a lot of sympathy for trying to do a marketing job on the one hand and then having to do another job which is justifying the funding for that by way of a rather convoluted KPI uh, system. Uh, and, and my heart goes out to you for that. Uh, but given that we've got this cumbersome KPI system uh, and given that we put a large resource into measuring marketing success, a resource I'd rather see going straight into actually doing the marketing, given that we've put this resource into measuring it, I believe that this measurement process really needs to have some rigour. And uh, if we've done the numbers, then I believe that they should reflect what the Statement of Intent says. In the case of the industry financial support, I don't believe it does. The uh, claim that um, equivalent advertising value is the same thing as, as um, uh, joint venture funding, obviously not the case. Uh, and therefore, the results met claimed regarding industry financial support I believe have to be not met. Now, I don't suggest that it necessarily changes anything in terms of what you're doing, but to me, if we could have a question mark or a not met beside that, I could happily vote for this. The fact that we don't means that unfortunately, because we've put so much resource into simply measuring the stuff, and I don't believe that the measurements stack up, I'm going to have to vote against. Well, I would note that. We're variously receiving or noting this, we're not approving it, depending on which um, recommendation you go with. Any further speakers? Right, Councillor Brown, do you wish to have your right of play? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? No. Recorded, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I imagine there may be some questions, but would you like to, perhaps Tony, just give a little bit of context as um, succinctly as possible, and then I'll open it up for, for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, the report that you have in front of you uh, represents, uh, I suppose, the outcome of a couple of years of work within the uh, Rural Fire uh, Authority community. 
uh, Phil Melhop. For those who don't know, Phil Melhop, who's the Chief Executive of uh, the Central Target District Council, led a working party looking at the possibility of an enlarged wall fire district for the uh, Otago uh, area. And Murray Dudfield, who is the National... Who is your yeah, National Rural Fire Officer, so National Rural Fire Authority representative, and we've been working with Murray uh, over a number of years looking at the options for an enlarged rural fire district. The report covers off the basis for that, but in a, a nutshell, the rural fire authorities within Otago have been meeting uh, and have come with a proposal to combine, create one new entity, of which we would be a part of, which would then deal with the rural fire activities for Otago. Uh, it's believed that there are very good synergies for Otago out of that mix. Um, each of the authorities has to find their own staff, their own resources, do their own planning. Uh, the proposal is to create a new entity with seven staff that would do that. Um, it's been through a, a fairly long gestation period. Um, <coughs> up until now, I think uh, three other councils have considered this in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Central Otago, Waitaki and Clutha and have all voted in support of the proposal. Okay. I understand the Clutha and Waitaki uh, committees have met but councils are still to consider. The Central Otago District Council resolved to support this last week. So it is a, uh, a cross council uh, proposal, uh, it's there for consideration. So. Okay, I'll open it up to questions. Councillor Thompson. Um, my, I, I've got one significant question, and, and that is around uh, what exactly it is that's broke at the moment that we that we need to fix. I I can see the the arguments that are made in the paper around that there are things that we do, you know, we all do separately, and that we could do them jointly, and that we would have consistency, and um, that we would be able to have. Um, training programs in place that were consistent across things, all of those kinds of things. I, I take that. Um, what's not clear to me though is that is what it is that's broke that we think is worth spending collectively another $240,000 a year to fix. And that which is broke, um, how, how important is it? And could it be managed um, within the existing structure for the expenditure of significantly less than $240,000 a year extra. Now, I have a second question, but I'll deal with that one separately. If I could possibly give you, a, I guess, a scenario of why this is attractive for, for some local authorities or uh, rural fire authorities. Um, typically, the rural fire authority is staffed by a one-man or a half-man band. Uh, that person, in our case, uh, may also stoke the boiler and also get rid of abandoned cars on the side of the road. Uh, we do pretty well focusing on fire response. We have a lot of uh, very good gear in Central Otago, for example. Uh, we have a number of volunteers. Training <coughs> is uh, OK. We get audited from time to time from National Rural Fire Authority. We all have our own fire plans. But we struggle with the, the small capacities we have in each rural fire authority. We work collectively across boundaries. Uh, there's little, if any, succession planning. Uh, there's really uh, there's duplication of resources. There's really little economies of scale. So for someone like myself, I guess, <coughs> sitting in the hot seat, uh, if we have a fire in our area and there's an insurance claim, I'll be coming to look to see how have we gone in our four hours, our uh, readiness, reduction, response and recovery. I'm confident we can do pretty well in response, but when it comes to a lot of these other items like um, reduction and readiness, I think when you've got one-man bands or half-man bands, it is difficult. And there's a lot of uh, potential efficiencies through bringing our six rural fire authorities together, so this includes DOC as well. And I'll give you an example of something that's broke uh, you take the, rural, um, the Otago um, Rail Trail, 155 kilometres long, it belongs to dock. One kilometre either side of that is dock area. If you want to burn within that area, you need a permit from dock. If you want to burn within the DCC boundary, you need a uh, permit from DCC, or if it's an outside from CODC. So 
there's issues like this um, where there, there are inefficiencies, but I think the biggest opportunities around um, improved planning, um, economies of scale, succession planning, and just not trying to do all these things individually when I think there's so much more merit in working uh, together. Yeah, that, that's certainly a question that's raised around the country and, and really this initiative uh, came from the stakeholders themselves about uh, eight years ago. Um, in the mid-1990s we had 121 rural fire authorities in New Zealand, 121 principal rural fire officers, 121 seats of signage. So there's a lot of confusion out, out there in the forest and rural sector over who the rural fire authority is, who the media is going to talk to, etc, etc. So what uh, stakeholders have done uh, over the past uh, 12 years have said, how can we do it better? And the proposal that's sitting on the table is, is the answer uh, to that question. Um, incidentally, in the South Island, um, all the regions uh, except uh, Otago and Canterbury have now merged. Um, you've got Nelson, you've got Kaikoura, Melbourne Kaikoura, you've got the West Coast, you've got South Canterbury, and you've got Southland. Um, and they're reaping the benefits um, uh, that Phil alluded to, uh, uh, to you earlier. So can I ask the second question? Yeah, sure. yeah. um, one, one of the issues that's been raised by um, uh, some of, is from some of our local volunteer fire brigade um, uh, rescue services, the impact on them, and it's alluded to in, in this paper, but it's not clear to me um, what those impacts might be and how I um, balance those off against the corporate efficiencies that you, um, you're advocating for here. So can uh, you give me some more details around that, please? Yes, I can certainly talk to that. Uh, under the analysis and, and the, the reports prepared to date, there's been no, uh, I guess, consideration of the existing volunteer forces or the arrangements in place for response. The intention is to leave that alone at this stage. So what's on the table is about, I guess, amalgamated governance and management. So as for the small forces and the resources that they are currently using, uh, no, consider what, no consideration at this stage. The new entity uh, would be for them to consider that in the future about efficiencies of resource deployment. And I note in the report here it alludes to some, some appliances in three communities that may be threatened. Uh, I just, that is premature to, to have that sort of analysis at this stage. Well, prem premature simply suggests that, um, uh, that they may have reason to be concerned further down the track, just not tomorrow. Um, surely that's a relevant uh, question and concern. Because it, to the extent that if that occurs and there are changes around, for example, resource rationalisation, that then might come back on to council's patch to offset that at the local level, then the costs that are outlined here could in fact change quite substantially. So that's why it seems to me quite a relevant factor. How the, the forces are deployed now and uh, equipment, the makeup, how fire response is delivered is not being questioned in, in this report and what's been proposed. Um, uh, through, I think, um, so in terms of the proposals, there's no proposal to change the volunteer rural fire force um, component of it. They would be reporting to a new entity, obviously. Um, what came up during the various bits of work, and I think this has happened in Southland, is that between the the six rural fire authorities, which includes DOC and the forest companies who also, also have their own equipment, it is possible, likely, that we've got too much equipment in some parts of the Otago and not enough equipment in other parts of, the, of Otago. Um, and under the proposal, that would be worked through by the new entity who would look at that resource rationalisation across the region. Um, and in that sense, the Council, uh, as the current rural fire authority, wouldn't have a direct control, but may through the, uh, maybe a representative on the board, but certainly through the stakeholder committee, which uh, each of the TLAs would have one representative on. Councillor Bezet. Yes, um, 
The NRFA say on page 18.11, um, this is um, with uh, promoting the key benefits of amalgamation, um, that areas that are currently under resource will benefit from the, from the overall increase in capacity and capability. Does that mean that, that somewhere like St Dunedin, for example, will be subsidising other areas? Um, well, I'm not sure you're subsidising, but certainly um, what's being discussed across um, the local authorities is the skill gap that we have and the uh, we're spread fairly thinly. Uh, Phil's identified that for himself and for the other smaller authorities. We do have a uh, capacity and capability issue. Um, so combining does provide the region with the ability to employ seven people full-time rather than our current um, situation where we're, we've got one full-time person, uh, but the others don't. Um, so it would be a spreading of the resources. I'm not sure that you'd, we could say it's a subsidy, but that is an inevitable reality of what's being proposed. Councillor Collins. Oh, I'm sorry. Martin. Probably just another comment that I could uh, add is that in this proposal, uh, the Department of Conservation is part of that partnership, and um, and you will notice uh, going through Clyde, for instance, on the right hand side, there is the central fire depot for the Department of Conservation. That will become a, a maintenance uh, depot for all the stakeholder resources. So there'll be some better uh, collaboration in respect of uh, servicing the. Um, the needs um, out in the wider region. So certainly the Department of Conservation is, uh, is part of the solution as well. I suppose it's really just a general question um, about this. Um, it's in my vision of rural fire services is probably quite wrong, but I, I envisage small pockets of dedicated volunteers that have got a shed or a garage or something and a clapped out on fire brigade which they try and get to uh, the job as quickly as they can and hope that they've got enough water on board to do it. When you, um, but nonetheless, they're, they're vital and, and important to those areas. And there have been, I've read of a couple of instances not too far from here where there have been difficulties getting a fire out or saving a property because of the lack of, of resources. And when, when we talk as we are here, about a merger or a bigger organisation, efficiency and things like that. Sometimes it raises a bit of fear in those small communities that will bigger be better, will you be better resourced, will you be faster to, to the fire, or are you going to slice some of these areas or pin them back so that they, they have a maybe a fear, unwarranted or warranted, that it often happens when, when the government comes and says we're going to slice here and slice there, that those services that they've made do with in the past may be gone altogether, or are you offering better than what they currently have? From a national perspective, you know, that, that same question and, and concerns has been raised, like so in Marlborough Kaikoura, uh, when that merger was proposed, and it was a, a small rural community that had a volunteer rural fire force uh, that, that raised some concerns. That's only the only submission that's been received around the last five proposals that have been uh, put up for mergers, that uh, a submission objecting to, um, uh, to the merger. Once there was engagement with that rural community and once they saw the benefits that could be gained uh, and that they weren't going to be impacted at all, in actual fact there was going to be more value added to supporting uh, the volunteerism in that small community, they were more than comfortable to that. In actual fact, the results have been that they've actually uh, uh, had greater support than was what are otherwise the case before. So it's, it's a fair concern, and it's about the steering committee and the stakeholders themselves engaging with those small communities uh, and talking about uh, this initiative uh, going forward and the benefits that can be accrued as a result of that. Councillor Oh, sorry, Phil, did you want just, to... Just, just fairly, if you don't mind, I, I personally think it's an opportunity for any of these smaller brigades who might feel as though they're under-resourced to actually do better. Uh, myself, I'm a member of the Dunstan Rural Fire Brigade, so I'm actually um, aware of the overall as well. Uh, we have a lot of good gear uh, and more volunteers. Some other areas have, have less um, equipment uh, with a lot of age on it. And I think there's an opportunity to stand back and look at all the resources in Otago and think, well, where do they best fit so that across the region 
uh, we can deliver an improved service. Just mate, I mean, at the end of the day, the residents of those areas, they just want to be convinced or relaxed in, the, in their minds that you can like, get there and put their fire out. Agreed, yeah. Have some attacks. I guess I, I, I'm hearing um, responses that are reassuring, but I'm not um, getting any sense of how it actually might work on the ground. And, and I come from Hamden, which is a small rural community staffed by a volunteer fire brigade. We, up there, um, whenever the fire alarm went off, we knew that there were, there were two trucks sitting in that shed up there, that there were men, there were people that were going to those trucks and they would be, as soon as they possibly could be there, because they were only coming from Hamden, they would be on site. And, and we had a family fire um, at the back, at, back in those days and it was a great reassurance to us when we heard that thing go off, we knew precisely where those trucks were, precisely where the men were coming and women were coming from to staff those trucks and we knew that they would be there within 10 minutes. What I'm not clear on in this proposal is how that level of service is going to be provided for all of our communities. And <clears throat> when I hear um, uh, issues raised around rationalisation of equipment, when I hear um, proposals around reallocation of services to areas of greatest threat, um, I don't hear in those words the type of reassurances we're hearing today. So my question, Sorry, Your Worship. Um, my question is, um, where, where is the reassurance to these small communities that they are not going to see an erosion of the level of service that they are currently provided? <coughs> and if, if there is going to be equipment rational, rationalisation and service rationalisation which occurs as part of the, this programme, how is that going to be achieved without erosion of service levels? One of the first things well, with any of the the current rural fire authorities, we have to have a, a fire plan which uh, looks at fire risk and, and identifies uh, resources and talks about levels of service. Uh, a new Otago and large rural fire authority will have to have that fire plan. It's required to have a, to undertake a wildfire threat analysis and work out where the, the, the greatest threat is. And then it has to resource that accordingly. So that's, that's the whole strategic uh, way that thing operates. But as for a categorical uh, reassurance that there will not be a change of level of service in one area versus another, well, we can't give that. It may be that one, one area might be over-serviced, another area uh, under-serviced. So those sorts of changes, I guess long-term, the new entity will need to look at strategically. Uh, I, I know from sitting in Alexandra, we have a lot of uh, equipment um, that Murray has kindly funded half of it over the years. We've done very well, we have a good response. There may be other areas that could actually do with one of those appliances. If we need to let one go to go to an area uh, that hasn't got the, the cover that it needs, then that sort of thing should happen. So really, that's uh, st strategically, the levels of service should be positioned for the, the hazard scale. Could I, could I just ask for some clarification? I, I, I'm, it appears to me, and I may have got this wrong, but it appears to me that we're talking about two different types of services that will be to some extent provided by the same resource. One is, um, in the case of you know, forest fires and open land fires, etc., and the other is the kind of house fire that volunteer fire service um, attend. So can you just speak to the distinction between the two and the kind and what implications this amalgamation, which I think relates to the former, will have. That's really the question. How this uh, proposal relating to largely dealing with open land fires or forest fires will, Im will impact on volunteer f uh, fire services that are uh, designed to look after people's uh, domestic or commercial building. So perhaps if I may, um, uh, volunteerism is, 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 is very important uh, to, to the industry that we're in and, um, and Hamden is, is one of those and, um, and, and, and I think we need to be mindful that the volunteers give up their time to support their community and will respond outside the community but I think where the strategy produces some uh, huge benefits is, is in the, 
the rangelands and the plantation fires where um, in the moment you've got a, um, 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 six or seven rural fire authorities in, in Otago and they all support each other very well for those extended fire events where resources are moved around the province, even brought in outside the province to, to manage a situation, help manage a situation when it occurs. So there's a, a more formalised partnership with forest owners who have a lot of trained soil cultural crews and Department of Conservation and local government itself. So after that first response, which is about 95% of all our events, are put out very quickly. A lot of those are done by volunteers uh, in communities. But where those 5% that, that incur 95% of the cost, that's when we've got to bring resources in uh, from, from around the province and even uh, outside the province to get the best outcome for those communities. And there's some very good examples uh, down here in Otago with uh, recent plantation fires and even in central Otago with the history of wildfires they've had in the high country there. So it's about having one song sheet for the, for the, for the province that allows good communication with the media, good communication with communities uh, to get the best outcome that they can. Well, can I just follow on from, because I'm not quite sure that my question has been answered. And that is, the fear that I'm hearing around the table is, we rearrange the resources f to attend to open land and forest fires, and it, in the reallocation of resource, it diminishes local communities' ability to attend to domestic fires. That's the question. Is that the case? No, you, Your Worship, uh, we have some brigades that are dedicated solely to, to rural fire. Uh, we have other brigades that do a, have a mixture of duties, rural fire and, and call outs to urban, take uh, our, our base in, in uh, Terrace, for example, they respond, their first response to motor vehicle accidents on the Lindus and to structure fires, although they cannot enter a structure and they cannot cut people out of vehicles, they are often the first to respond there while they get backed up from Cromwell or Amarama. So these brigades have a mixture of, of responsibilities uh, some, of those, some of that gear is funded by New Zealand Fire Service, some is funded by uh, the uh, National Rural Fire Authority. Uh, th these brigades, um, whether they're volunteer or contracted, some of them are from contracts within councils, we see that as being un untouched. Uh, we, we are looking here at the, the amalgamation of the administration and management of rural fire. We don't see this as interfering with those existing arrangements, uh, service levels will need to be reviewed in time, but to suggest that uh, there will be a reduction of response to, to urban or motor vehicle incidents at the, uh, in favour of, of um, rural fire, that's, no, that's not correct. Councillor Butcher. Oh, I've got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, I see that you um, very wisely consulted with Federated Farmers, but I don't see in here people who may have small holdings who are, might not necessarily be part of Federated Farmers. What sort of consultation have you done with those sorts of people? The, the consultation to date has included uh, Federated Farmers and the forestry companies, the major stakeholders. Uh, we haven't gone out any further uh, into the community, other than to note this in our long-term plan and our annual plans and the build-up to this. This has been on the table since March 2010. Uh, but just to give you a, a bit of context, um, with our or Central Otago District Council Resident Opinion Survey, uh, we get 600 returns recently. Off those 600 returns, there were 631 narrative comments making comment about the council. We received four for rural fire, we received 80, 83 for potable water. So. From our council's position is that rural fire does not sit that high on the radar for a great number of our community. We've consulted, we believe, with the key stakeholders being the forestry companies and federated farmers. And through the next phase of this, if um, the authorities agree to promote an amalgamation, then the National Rural Fire Authority has to run a, a submission process, which is not dissimilar to our local government uh, submission process. In which case, anybody with further uh, views can uh, express them. Okay, so there is still room for lifestylers to have a say, because quite often it's a squeaky wheel, isn't it? And you can't be watching what's going on all the time. It's not until somebody puts the thing under your nose that you go, oh my God, I might be affected by that, I better put in a submission. So getting back to that then, so with the levy, 
would you be seeing that as um, going, if it was going through the rating system, so for example for DCC, would ratepayers then be expected to also have, a, have another go at it on their Otago Regional Council rates, or would it just be one or the other? Um, <clears throat> there's no Otago Regional Council rates for rural firefighting that I'm aware of. Uh, this council uh, funds the rural fire activity out of, out of the general rates. There's no specific levy for that. Under the proposal, it would continue to be funded out of the same source. Um, if at some point there was a desire to change the, the mechanism for that, then we wouldn't see a rate of rural landowners being charged twice. Okay. That's good. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Banders. Um, I was impressed by the, the depth of the Morrison Low um, uh, report and also how important it may seem to be that there are going to be real advantages to this amalgamation, as you suggest. Uh, on page 18.20, um, you say there's a strong national drive to amalgamate, and we've seen some of the reasons for that. You, you've, you've listed some of these saving um, uh, opportunities as duplication of resources, a much larger scale opportunities, succession planning, clarity of authority, and consistency of operating plans. Um, that actually represents a fairly significant part of uh, the rural fire service cost, does it not? All that planning, um, uh, uh, scale opportunities, duplication of resources. Surely there is very significant opportunities in that lot to have some real savings. My question is, you basically answered that, given that there are these um, s significant savings to be had with duplication of resources, much larger scale opportunities. Why is it on 18.2 that you say, while initial operating costs will be higher than they are currently, efficiencies of scale and improved applications are expected to drive down costs in the future. Why couldn't we get efficiencies coming through almost immediately? I mean, I recognise as a transition budget, I wonder why 100k is so high. Um, but why is it that given all the opportunities of duplication of resources, larger scale, succession planning, clarity of authority, consistency of plans, why is it that we wouldn't see a much more certain driving down of the costs? That's, that's a good question. And we got Morris and Lowe to model the financials based on the accumulation of existing operational costs. It would have been very difficult for them and, and myself to second guess some of those efficiencies. And we don't want to get this thing off over the line and from day one be chasing our tails and from a budgetary point of view. We've, so we've accumulated the operating costs, we've overlaid the additional costs that we know of and the additional costs are essentially a PRFO <coughs> and any governance costs that, that come with that. The $240,000 extra is the additional funding from what Morrison Lowe forecast versus what Council said they could release to the new entity. So some of the rural fire authorities had budgets but because they have embedded costs, for example a PRFO might also be the emergency manager, that hasn't been able to be released. I believe that once this entity is established and up and running and can look at its efficiencies and its resource allocations, that that additional $240,000 can be reduced in time. Um, I can also uh, comment that um, we're hoping that the, guy, the team have worked on a conservative estimates um, rather than optimistic estimates so that hopefully we're on the, the right side of the ledger to, to pull back rather than having to come back with more money requests later on. So trying to set it up on an even footing. Councillor Wilson. Um, I've got a number of questions, I'm sorry. Um, the first one is I, caveated with, I know in the rural communities that we are really impressed with what we've got already. And that's a credit to um, Brian Still and his guys. And we've been really happy with the um, reaction and response to rural fires. Um, and the concern is that we are very aware that, they, that at the fire brigade it is um, seamless between rural fires and an urban uh, community fire. 
and that it just seems to work. Um, and because that's really good relationships. Now, Murray, you talked about consultation in Marlborough and that when you got a submission against, you went and talked to them. And I'm just wondering if that's the way you normally do consult consultation because to me, the strength would be to go and talk to all the communities first as part of your consultation round rather than waiting for the submissions against. And I'm just wondering what the submission process you're um, considering as being an opportunity to also introduce you to yourself to the, in the system to the rural communities um, if we agree to the first set of motions in this paper. Yes, certainly uh, we've always had um, 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 an objective of trying to address any concerns uh, that have been raised and sometimes you don't know what you don't know until, until some of those are raised with you. Certainly this has had an impact on, on some staff around New Zealand where there's been mergers and sometimes the right communication is not getting out uh, to, the, uh, to the people and, and certainly in, in Marlborough, up in the Archery Valley, but like uh, Central Otago, the, um, uh, the high country farmers um, 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 certainly uh, use fire as a land management tool and uh, certainly federated farmers at a national level have been involved from the very early stages, in actual fact, they promoted uh, the mergers of, of smaller uh, uh, rural fire authorities. And, and we tasked uh, Federated Farmers to go and talk to the high country people to answer the questions that they had been raised when all of a sudden there was a proposal uh, for a merger in Melbourne Kaikoura on the horizon. So it is a partnership, it's a partnership with the stakeholders and, um, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the landowners and, uh, and I believe that this uh, steering committee down here has done a very good job but there will be questions come out that perhaps we haven't um, uh, provided the answers to or the answers have come second hand and perhaps aren't the answers that we're uh, wishing to be presented to the, uh, to the landowners. <coughs> uh, so it's, it is an engaging, an engaging process uh, but it's about getting good ownership and uh, if you get good ownership you get good outcomes. So I'm not quite sure that that answers my question. So, um, after if, if we took the first draft of um, recommendations here and left the consultation to you, yeah. and it gets gazetted, what do you do to engage the communities to ensure that a they know about it, b that they um, feel like they're engaged in the process and feel security as it, and and can submit? Because I'm not clear on that. I know what the process would be under the Local Government Act, um, and I know that. I mean, I've talked to some rural fire officers, I've talked to some local community board people who are happy, but they want to know the pro uh, accept it. If they knew that what the consultation process is, when, 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 I'm not clear as to what your processes are. Well, what's on the, the, uh, the transition plan down here, uh, once we get a, um, um, a green light to proceed to the next stage, is uh, Phil um, and, and the NRFA have worked together and, and one of the first things on the, on the program of, of change is a, is a newsletter that goes out to as many of those stakeholders that, that you've made reference to and we'll be looking to um, uh, the local authorities to help distribute that information uh, to the key people that you made reference so they know that something's coming up. It will be advertised um, uh, as a proposal to, uh, to the general public and um, and submissions will be requested through the uh, through the um, uh, uh, through this process, which is defined under the Forest Rural Fires Act. If there are any submissions, uh, certainly the stakeholders would be approached about those submissions. <coughs> saying, well, is is there something here that's been missed? Uh, so we'll be listening to the key stakeholders, but we'll also be listening to those that made the submissions as well. So it's a it's a two way two way process. And if it needs to go to a formal hearing, then 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 then. Um, then that's uh, what will be done. Uh, as I said, in the last six proposals that have gone up, we've only had one submission opposing uh, a merger in, in the Melbourne Kaikoura. And taking that further, if there were one submission, would you hold a hearing and would you hold it at, um, near to the place where that submission was made in order that they, pe people and the community, which we would otherwise have to consult with, feel like they can be heard? Uh, the answer is, is yes to that. Then the question I have is, would, and, and I don't want to get into the resolution because it hasn't been put, but I have a question on the resolution that is posed, whether it had a clause in it that was subject to RN, NRFA undertaking a formal hearing process if submissions were received in Dunedin. Because I think that, that we have to make sure that the process isn't necessarily somewhere like in Queenstown, which makes it less easy for the local people to submit at. No problem with that request at all. 
Thank you. I, I, I'm just trying to align it as much as possible with what we would have to do under the Local Government Act. And the last question I think I've got is, um, uh, Tony, just ensuring that this, does, uh, that this process meets all the requirements under our responsibilities for under the Local Government Act to specially consult and th there aren't any problems with that. No, we don't believe so. And, and uh, that was certainly the subject of a uh, discussion at the regional CEs meeting recently where we talked about the process. Um, and the, uh, there's a clear statutory process under the, um, the, the, the um, I suppose, the NRFA uh, Empowering Act, whatever it's called, the Thank you, Forest and Royal, Royal Fires Act, which spe specifies the process for the establishment of an enlarged rural fire district. Um, that provides the consultation mechanism under the uh, Council's long-term plan. That would be um, no change in terms of the funding mechanism, but the method of delivery would change. Um, to the enlarged rural fire district, but that would be consulted all through that process. So I did have one question, um, and I, it's one that I raised at the workshop. I appreciate that rural fires works very, very well with civil defence, and it's just again a surety that there is no doubt in your mind, Tony, as I think it's your purview, um, that we, our civil defence operations will not be compromised by this change. No, no, there won't be. Uh, and we'd certainly see, even with the enlarged rural fire district and the volunteer rural fire authorities or forces, uh, still a close relationship. Uh, I think it would be the same across uh, all of Otago, where each of the local authorities would have exactly the same issue. In fact, there may be some strengthening around those relationships through uh, an entity. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. I've got a couple of questions. Um, and it follows on from what the Mayor has said and, and also Councillor Wilson and Councillor McTavish about why is the concern with some of the, um, the volunteer fire brigades. And Councillor Wilson talked about the seamless uh, relationship between the rural authority and I imagine the same right throughout the country where over the years they've developed a good, strong relationship. Um, they've shared resources and probably more so from the um, the the authority to the volunteer brigade than the other way. So my questions around, I know of an example. If you take Waikawati for example, 40 k's uh, to the north of the city, they rely on a, a tanker uh, for part of the township simply because it's a low pressure water scheme. Um, it delivers a cubic meter over a 24 hour period. So they need the tanker as an adjust, additional appliance to their firefighting appliance simply to be effective to put fires out. So that's a sort of concern that I think exists out there and that's the sort of thing that we need to somehow ensure that we can appease those volunteers and reassure them that there's nothing here that they've currently got they're going to lose in the future because they're effectively, effectively an asset belonging to the, um, the city as being, being the, uh, the Rural Firefighting Authority. Um, so that's, that's my first question, then I have another one for Murray. I can talk to that in some detail just from our Central Otago experience. We have two tankers, one in Alexander, one in Taras, and we attach them to the, the urban fire brigades if there's a call out uh, to any area with non-reticulated water supply. So that's the, the rural fire uh, pages go off and we turn out to that. So we support the guys in the, the red machines. And likewise, they support us for the first hour of any rural fire. So those relationships are there now. Uh, I don't see them changing. They are very important. And you don't see the, the, any risk in terms of the assets being uh, absorbed into a, a regional authority that could potentially be shifted around to another area or where they deem, where they deem as, as being more important to have that asset based or that resource based throughout the region? So effectively, if there's a, if there's a resource based in a certain area for a good reason, it's not likely to be shifted around. All I can say is if an urban brigade needs tanker support, uh, it's important that they have it. The question for Murray was, relates to the funding model, and I'm just wondering um, with the other regions that moved, have moved to a, an amalgamated uh, authority, uh, is the one particular model that they've followed, obviously the, what's suggested in front of us, there's a transition period, a three year, three to four year uh, period in terms of funding, and I just wondered what other um, areas have done in terms of what model they've followed uh, if they're further down the track? 
Yeah, this has certainly been a, a source of great debate around the country. There, there certainly is no silver bullet in, uh, in, in a, an equitable funding model. Uh, what the National Rural Fire Authority has done is, is put a, a model together that's based around, uh, around risk, um, uh, which is on the landscape. Um, the fire climate, um, the climate around New Zealand is, is different from the west coast to the east coast. Central Otago is a little bit different from coastal Otago. Uh, in the risk itself is around plantation and conservation values, and um, we've also included a, a base um, component in that in that uh, funding model. Um, and as I said to other steering committees uh, and to the Otago steering committee, that, that the model we've got is not a, um, a silver bullet. It gets you um, sort of three quarters, 80 percent along the way, and then it's, uh, it's local factors that come in that gets an agreement across the table uh, at the end of the day. From an NRFA funding perspective, uh, those of you that have had time to read the, the recent conclusions to the independent uh, review that was undertaken by government on fire services, uh, which supported uh, the merger of small RFAs into larger entities, um, that review also recommended that the, uh, uh, the Commission and the government uh, look at um, further incentivisation uh, for the enlarged bull fire district strategy. And, and we're currently working on, on a, um, a proposal that um, uh, will probably base more around the, the mitigation area that Phil re referred to in respect of wildfire threat analysis and those sorts of things. So that hasn't been done, but it's looking at where the risks are and how those risks can be mitigated again so that fire can be useful as a land management tool, uh, but also in respect of um, being able to identify the hotspots with wildfires and being able to resource those. Just on your, on your first question, if I may, uh, one of the um, advantages of an enlargeable fire district is the New Zealand Fire Service, the National Commander, appoints a fire service member to the authority, to the board. And that primary reason is to ensure that those urban rural interface um, uh, concerns, if there are any, are being met on a, on a monthly basis. And if there are any concerns from a fire service, they can be uh, they can be addressed at a governance level because the fire service is sitting around the governance table when policies are being considered. And having one rural, principal rural fire officer dealing with all the fire service volunteer chiefs and paid chiefs um, uh, will get a consistent message across the province in respect of how uh, that integration that's working well between urban fire and rural fire uh, can be further enhanced going forward. Uh, having one uh, chief executive slash principal rural fire officer for the province.